So my name is Ann Bruce. Uh, I am the hierophant of the Church of Witchcraft, which means I'm just the head guy. Um, I just keep kind of things on the rails and make sure things happen and that we get everything done and coordinate stuff with everybody and that kind of thing. Um, so the Church of Witchcraft is about revitalizing witchcraft under a flexible common practice. Uh, and I particularly practice celestial witchcraft, but people are kind of practicing witchcraft at random, and they don't really know if they're doing it or if they are doing it. Sometimes it's intentional, sometimes it's not intentional, it kind of goes across the board. Uh, there's a lot of different modalities that exist, and we're always interested in all the modalities. So every type of witchcraft that we can talk about, that we want to encompass and also help further their goals as well. Uh, also, thank you to whoever's watching this in the future for YouTube or whatever platform you're watching this on. I appreciate the attendance online, even if you're not here in person. We would love to see you in person, though. Um, so, yeah, we, like I said, we upload all of these to YouTube. Does anybody need to get annex their names or change their names or use numbers in case they want to keep their identity quiet? <laughs> nope, nobody cares? Cool. I just want to check because some people are in the broom closet, and so we try to respect that, which is why all of our guest lists are private on all of our events, so that there's not a conflict of interest and people can have, you know, preserve their anonymity if they want to. So today I'm talking again about thaumaturgy. I brought this up in Denver. Um, we're going to have to have kind of a crash course. Has anybody looked at the theurgy stuff yet? No? No theurgy? No? Okay, well. I know Amber. <laughs> Amber was at that, at that last one too. Uh, it's on our website, uh, on our YouTube, so you can find that through uh, It's just if you go to our website, churchwitchcraft.org. The churchwitchcraft.org has a little link for YouTube that goes straight to it, so you can find all of that. So I'm going to give you guys a, guys a kind of crash course in this. So, what is theurgy and what is thaumaturgy? I know that some of you have heard this, so I'll keep it as short as I possibly can. Uh, so, theurgy is essentially miracle working is the best way they can phrase that, and that seems pretty broad as to whatever that means. In my understanding of theurgy, it comes across as basically a connection with the all source, everything, right? Trying to minimize your ego and then increase your mysticism or increase your connection to that which is divine, right? So connecting to everybody else. The opposite side of that is then thaumaturgy, becoming the god self. So you yourself becoming the pinnacle of all divinity instead of connecting with all the things that are divine. So that sort of makes sense. Also, feel free to interrupt and ask questions. I'm happy to answer them. That's what we're here for. You're not here just to hear me blather at you. Please feel free to engage and ask questions. And also tell me, hey, I think you're wrong. That helps us too because that helps the, you know, this conversation, collaboration, is really what we have in mind, collaborating with everybody. So, do you think I'm off base? Let me know. Or if you have something to add, you can do that too. I have a quick question. Um, my familiarity with Amaturgy is through the Vampire Card Game, which mm -hmm. references it as blood magic, essentially. Right. Um, how is that connected to your understanding of it? So, Thaumaturgy being the god self, or the me being the most divine thing, is focused on the material or physical plane. So, when you're talking about things like a blood magic or whatever, that's the physical plane, not the metaphysical plane, right? So, like the divine realm or whatever, right? So, what it is very corporeal, which is why it would be linked to that, and it would definitely be. Let's just go with the assumption without any sort of debate about we're just going to give the assumption that blood magic is the thing, which yes it is, and it's a very long topic, and I'm not going to get into it right now. But you'll find it in the sanctuary at Voodoo Voodoo, you'll see it in those kinds of places, and that would be classified to me as thaumaturgy, right? Because it's dealing with the physical plane and physical representation. Um, and you'll also see this in D&D, by the way. You'll see theurgy and thaumaturgy also show up in various fantasy sort of games that arise. Uh, originally, these two terms were connected, and they were just connected under Gnosis, which then became Gnosticism. When it became Gnosticism, you couldn't just say Gnosis anymore because then everything that was Gnosticism was Gnosis. Gnosis being that uh, knowing yourself or know thyself. That Gnostic ideation ended up having to split Thaumaturgy and Theurgy into separate categories because of the fact that Gnosis kind of got usurped by Gnosticism just by virtue of the title itself. And so theurgy and thaumaturgy as individual things kind of arose from there. Otherwise, you could just reference theurgy and thaumaturgy as gnosis. Um, and that's a really long topic to not one that I'm well versed in, just because it's, I mean, gnosis is its own huge religious magico-spiritual system. 
and I don't purport to know all of them to the you know exacting of every single one of them. It's not possible. Um, well, so we'll see you again in a few years, <laughs> right? I know a lot about I've learned a lot of things. So I'm like a mile wide but like two inches deep. <laughs> I know a lot of things, but I don't know them really in depth. I know enough about them to get in trouble. <laughs> and it caused some ruckus. So theurgy being that connection to the all. Uh, the other two parts of that axis, so you have a cross like a graph, right? You have your thaumaturgy at the bottom, and you have theurgy at the top, and then on the opposite sides are chaos and order. So you can have ordered theurgy or chaotic theurgy and vice versa. So chaotic thaumaturgy, ordered thaumaturgy. The majority of contemporary witchcraft today falls into essentially order thaumaturgy, thaumaturgy, because what is your witchcraft? What do you use it for? Assuming that all of you do practice and do spells and stuff. Mm -hmm. So what does your, <laughs> roughly, so what does it focus on? What area does it focus on? Material realm influencing it to achieve a desire. Mm -hmm. Exactly, same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically. Yeah, basically, mm -hmm. same thing. I mean, we're in a bizarre classification because of this. So. The reason we talk about this is not because we're saying, we're trying to at least build a common narrative so we can start talking about these things because then phenomena that exists without, independent of systems or traditions or religious orders and that sort of thing. So we can sort of kind of get on the same page. Most contemporary witchcraft, like I was saying, just even in this room, is primarily about this realm. What you want to create for yourself, what you're doing for yourself, how you're enhancing yourself, all of those things, and it's around that crux. And that is what most contemporary witchcraft is, and that's okay. Note that I'm not making any claim, and I will never make any claim about what is right or wrong. There may be a few exceptions about morality. Like, you probably shouldn't just, just keep the kids safe. I think it's like the one universal I think we can all kind of get on board with, like, make the kids safe. That's probably my only universal where I'm like, that's pretty wrong. Like, we're just, we need to keep them safe. That's the only thing. Uh, that I can think of immediately. But generally, I'm not going to fall into count categories of right and wrong, because by whose metric? Which century? Which gender? Is it a gender thing? Is it a sex thing? Who knows what it is? It's too hard to describe, and that's up to your individual choices. So whatever you want to do with this, if you want to declare something right or wrong, know why you're doing it, so go with some conviction. And conviction is kind of tricky, because then you start making rules, you start drawing boundaries and guidelines and stuff, and things get a little weird when you start trying to put things in boxes. <laughs> so ordered thaumaturgy into something like witchcraft. Ordered thaumaturgy also falls into, uh, Christianity falls into that as well in some iterations. Ordered theurgy looks like, normally I would have, uh, there'd be a whiteboard, but this is what we're dealing with. <laughs> the reason I say that is because this location is a little bit awkward and we don't have all of our normal resources, so bear with us, please, and we appreciate it. Uh, so with the ordered theurgy, for example, you're looking at things like the Astika schools in India, so things that are like traditional yoga from India where they're trying to do sequential steps that are going to bring about enlightenment, or meditative steps to bring about enlightenment. There's a very ordered segment of how to do that. You go from place A, and you go to place Z, and there's steps to do those things, and you're trying to attain that enlightenment, ergo, order, theurgy. Chaotic theurgy would be things like, uh, psychedelics would be a great example of that as well. Um, so it, you're just shortcutting yourself there, right? So it's this chaotic thing, you're not taking any steps to get to theurgy, you're kind of shortcutting your way through. Again, not right and wrong, but not very sustainable. You can't just like do that all the time, every day. You kind of like live. <laughs> here and do stuff because you actually have to eat and drink water and stuff, so you can do it, but like I said, it just kind of shortcuts your way through it, it's not something you can really sustain. When you get into chaotic, um, chaotic thaumaturgy specifically, you're looking at things like modern chaos, for example. We're going to take whatever representation of divinity, we're going to define that, and then we're going to have some sort of ritualistic practice around those things. It could be any of those things. The rituals may be very disparate in scope. So one might be a dancing, an ecstatic dance, for example. Another might be something to do with their, you know, hiking or whatever. But they're two very different things, but it's still part of their continued process, basically. Yeah? I have a question about, um, so Kundalini Yoga might be something that would be ordered. Mm -hmm. And then I would ask with, like, a different kind of plant medicine, 
if it was done in a ceremonious fashion with someone facilitating, would that change from chaotic to order, or would it still be chaotic? I think that's an, I think that's a personal thing. I would probably still classify that as chaotic because of the reason that yes, the crash around that is ordered, but there wasn't like you went to a thing and it wasn't a sequential step to get there. It was I went to one event and then this thing occurred. Okay. And so it wasn't if you weren't building up in yourself that process for that enlightenment. So that's kind of where my thought process go. But you could make a very strong uh, point about that being an ordered process. Plus, who knows what happens when you go there? Right. right. You might actually have an experience, or you might not. Right. Exactly. And it's kind of a hit or miss thing, you know, depending on set setting and all of those things, which is beyond the scope of this and not in our purview until future stuff has to happen. <laughs> um, okay, so questions on theurgy at all at the moment? No. Good, okay. Which is, yeah, where would you put channeling uh, that's like minimizing ego to connect with some source? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a lot of different variations there. However, generally, I guess, again, it's personal focus, uh, but a lot of people use channeling to get information about this world mm -hmm. rather than like how to transcend and, or enlighten. Ordered thaumaturgy. So the other way that it can that gives a pretty good description of this, for example, is we're going to use Marvel terms. Marvel terms, whatever it doesn't matter. <laughs> Basically, Scarlet Witch would be the you know in the chaotic you know thaumaturgy side. She can do whatever she wants with her own power, right? Whereas if you have Doctor Strange, he channels things through him to affect change in the physical realm, right? So similarly, if you're channeling something, I am bringing something in from the metaphysical to the physical to affect the change. Something is working through me. Um, and you're right, you're kind of, you're hitting on a very, a, a distinction that's important. Which is better, which one, how are these things connected, right? Thaumatur does thaumaturgy come before theurgy, or does theurgy come before thaumaturgy, right? They beget one another, basically. And there is a pretty blurry line between where one begins and where one ends. Really, I think it comes down to the scope of your practice and what you are intending to do with it. So if you're just like, I'm just going to go get enlightenment and do whatever, well, that pretty much tells us where we're at, right? If it's something like, I want to go do this with these sequential steps to get here, then you have a better idea, right? But which one begets the other? So the more theurgic stuff that I do, so when I do things like prayer, or if I do think, you know, other versions of worship and that sort of thing, that is connecting with the divine, theurgically, right? But it impacts my ability to do thaumaturgic stuff as well. So they are correlated, and there is a link between those two things, and it comes down to my intent. When I'm casting, like, I was doing a working uh, the other Wednesday, today's Wednesday, Monday, I was doing a working Monday, we were sealing a box, it's a long story. <laughs> You'll hear that later. <laughs> we had, it was a thing. Uh, but that specifically was this realm, working with a physical object, thaumaturgic, but the fact that I have that connection to the divine, the way that I do, that it, it gives, it provides more potency and efficacy to the physical working here. So where does that line end and begin? It's fuzzy, right? And I think it comes down to that intent that you are, you're, like I said, you're hitting on that distinction of, well, which one's which, right? It's hard to say. So yeah, dynamically balanced. Yes. And this is something that I talked about also before and I'll continue to say is that I don't really work well with binaries. I would work way better with polarities, right? Binary is either it's either zero or one. And even that's not really its own binary because between zero and one, there's zero point zero zero infinite repeating one and then so on to one. And that's still a polarity. You can work in binary systems because it makes it easier and our brains as humans do really well with binaries. Uh, but it's not necessarily helpful in this kind of context, so I tend to think of this polarity. So you can, whatever is thaumaturgic, sorry, thaumaturgic on the bottom, as it, it's just less theurgic. The more theurgic you get, the less thaumaturgic, but they're essentially the same component of the, they're the same phenomena at different spectrum points, and you can work somewhere in that polarity spectrum. It's not just, I am theurgic, I am thaumaturgic, I'm somewhere in this mixture. Right? <laughs> so thaumaturgy, that was what I was getting to. So identifying that, we're gonna, I get to tell a story. I forgot about the story entirely. Uh, and I, 
have so many stories. I'm sure most of you do as well. So with Thaumaturgy, there was an event where, now I'm just I'm gonna have to translate this thing here, how I wanna do that. So I went through a very difficult transition out of a relationship at one point in time, a few years back. And in that, during the relationship, she had provided, she had given me a charmed, an enchanted object, right? It was a pentagram and stuff, and she was coming from a Christian side, which was really interesting. So she came from like a hardcore English Christian side. She, had, she was of both countries, right? So anyways, so she built this thing. She crafted this together, and she put all those twigs and sticks together, and she had rope that she had gotten from the beach in her native town, and then had gotten shells and all that stuff and put it together and did a working for this thing. Never had done so much spell work before, and all of this was to give me a gift for you. Which, this is a very price option. The reason I tell you about this specifically in this way is because this is part of that enchantment, right? So we've talked about in our Discord, and if you want this, uh, also I can send it to you. We have a spell map that basically kind of describes a framework of spells and how they work. Spells being an overarching concept. Uh, within that is enchantment. So this specific object was an enchanted object from this woman, right? So I had a place of honor within my house, it's a long, it doesn't really matter where it was, but it was an important object. Things didn't go, went awry later on down the road between us. She left and I was not really able to, I was dealing with that myself. And so I had been asked actually just here in town, some years ago, I was walking around and somebody had asked me, who do you, I ended up talking to somebody who said, I, you know, I want to, you know, there's somebody that should know, or somebody, somebody famous, like not. But I told her that I was involved in the Church of Witchcraft. She recoiled in horror. I know I'm getting back to my story, trust me, it's gonna make sense. <laughs> so she recoils in horror, we have a conversation. She at least calms down, and we have a good conversation. But she asked me, who do I turn to in times of crisis? And I was like, uh-oh, I don't know how to answer that. I can now, I actually have an answer for that. But this goes back to the original and the first story that I was talking about with this enchanted object. I was in a time of crisis dealing with this situation and parting from this person, and I couldn't handle it. I didn't know what to do. Like, I ended up taking myself out to, like, went to the orchestra because that's the place I like to go. I like to go see art stuff. Um, I also went to an Airbnb in Crestone and had some wild adventures down there for a minute. There was a forest pizza situation that happened there. There was a whole bunch of cool things that happened, and then I came back. I was still dealing with this, and I just couldn't get past it. So what do I turn to? I turn to witchcraft, right? I turn to my practice, and that's one of the biggest things. So this is now we're into this thaumaturgic thing. So this is a thaumaturgic story about what I'm dealing with. So this object I just, I was like, I don't want to do. I need something, and I relied on something thaumaturgy to be able to affect a change. And my idea, which worked spectacularly and alarmingly well, uh, I decided that I was going to do a spell of severance, right? So I was like, cool, I'm going to use this object. I'm going to take this off and channel all of my emotions into this object, right? I'm going to make this a lot, and basically I found, <laughs> I found hammers, and I found fire, and I found all sorts of stuff to destroy this object. So I spent you know, a few hours destroying this thing across this planet and whatever. So I'm in my backyard with this giant bonfire, and I'm breaking this thing apart and whatever. And, you know, it felt very good. It was very cathartic for me, right? And I was like, okay, cool. And this was my idea. I was ending, I was severing this connection to this individual. In so doing, I felt so much better and lighter the next day. You know, I woke up the next morning, everything was fine, and I cleaned up everything and that sort of thing. Fast forward several months. I have really no recollection of this person now, and this is some of the, this is some of the, when people are like, oh, okay, be careful about spells and those kinds of things, the ramifications of them. I didn't really think of it at the time, but the, uh, what I realized was is that I don't really have any ex existing memories of this individual anymore. I know they existed. I have a, an idea of what their name is. I know kind of some basic facts, but like the memories and the experiences and the emotions, all erased, completely gone. Now, you would think, this is great. I thought it was great too, but you really need your experiences and you need your emotions. You need these things to be a part of you. You don't want to erase these experiences. Now, I'm not saying don't do this. I'm just saying be wary when you're doing spell work and that sort of thing for and errant ramifications. That also being said, this was a thaumaturgic thing. I was affecting a physical part of the, myself trying to eradicate this specific connection. I was very successful in so doing. Um, and, but now, 
I'm, I'm bereft of these things, right? So thaumaturgy can be very effective. You know, I'm sure that people out here and whoever's, wherever you're watching this, you know, are also have those kinds of experiences. You all here have probably had similar experiences to that. Why they work, why they don't work, how they happen, I don't really have an answer for you. That's a, that's a long philosophical conversation that I don't really have an answer for. <laughs> so thaumaturgy can be effective, and that's one example of that. You can affect a physical thing, you can affect a non-corporeal thing, e.g. my memories or those sorts of things, right? Another way that I can do that is by this board behind me, which is one of the... So, I made this. Uh, this is another thaumaturgic working, an enchanted object for knowledge and gaining knowledge. Uh, it'll use some alchemical principles, I'm not going to go great into detail, we can talk about it later. Uh, but basically, this was an enchanted object, thaumaturgic, used for purposes here for accessing knowledge, retaining knowledge, and that sort of thing. Consistently, over the last three or four years that I've been, that I, whenever I utilize this specifically, my grade is significantly statistically higher across something like 30 or 40 different classes over a period of three or four years, something in that realm. And this helps me retain knowledge and whatnot. Why it works? Not sure. It could be just the programming. I don't know. It could just be the indication. But that, again, is a debate for all the rest of you, and I encourage everybody to have that. But again, thaumaturgic work, you can enchant objects like that, so you can do a physical thing, as well as doing something that's non corporeal. So corporeal or non corporeal are options. I'll go ahead and pause there and see if anybody has any thoughts or questions about any of these things. So, the instance of like you destroying the enchantment, would that be like a chaotic instance, or would that be an order instance? I would say that that would be because that I have because I have a central practice. So I do the celestial witchcraft. There's a sequence of that. There's a system around that. The things that I did were part of that system for that ordered use. So that's how kind of contemporary witchcraft falls into that ordered thaumaturgy kind of side because it has a plan. It wants to go with an idea. It's using the traditional system that you're working with for a specific end goal. Are there any examples that you want to give of any thaumaturgic works that you may have done? Ooh. <laughs> Everybody in the audience just now just like had this like very curious, like concerned look of like, wait a minute, have I had a thaumaturgic practice? <laughs> something that is an internal development of, you know, your own divinity and your own magic, or is it more of something that you need to hear, like, hey, I feel lost about this thing, or this event is, like, where's that focus? And so it's, think of it as a Y branch, or just a branching path, right? So if I'm doing tarot, if I'm doing some sort of divination, that divination is going to diverge into theurgic or thaumaturgic sort of focus. Uh, Theurgy also talks more about community connection. So, acts of service, right? Things that you do for the community. One of the things, and I've said this, uh, and I will continue to say this ad nauseum, that the, um, one of the functions of myself in the role of the church is to continue to provide basically a beacon of theurgic and thaumaturgic options and energy and that sort of thing. So us collectively as a congregation with clergy, those are all sort of our intent to do that and provide a big font of those things. So there's a big glut available for people. And we keep seeing consistently now, we're starting to see people see an increase in their potency and their efficacy when they're part of the church and that sort of thing. So that's been really interesting to see that phenomenon. Why it's working, I don't know. But again, it's I'm seeing a lot of anecdotal evidence that supports that claim. I 
and that we don't have an extra thought leader who works yet, do we? Do you guys think of one yet? Um, yeah, I have a, a pretty interesting uh, example. Marvelous. Um, so I've played a number of ecstatic dances, mm -hmm. and I craft the, the journey of the music uh, ahead of time, generally. Mm -hmm. Um, and in so doing, in the crafting, I'm, I'm putting a lot of intention, not like full on formal spell work, but mm -hmm. definitely energetically infused with intention of, however, so I'm using a thaumaturgic uh, tool for theurgic means. The intention is generally like assist people with their own evolution, like mm -hmm. let them wake up to whatever it is that they are going to find for themselves. Yes. You know, not programming in, you are going to have this experience. Right. Uh, but just like general support of movement up the theurgic polarity. Exactly, yeah. It's a perfect way to represent that. There's a lot of ways that you can do both of them. And again, like I said, I think it just comes down to your intent behind that more than anything else. And formal versus informal spell work. I tend to think of it more in intuitive versus planned. So some spell work is just intuitive, very specifically. Sometimes I just start, like, I'm sure most witches do this, and most people who do magical practices tend to do this, they just sort of like gather and collect things from like random places, like water from this location, some random acorn, a dead spider, you just sort of amass these things. Uh, and for me, very much, this is the intuitive side of spell work, where it just sort of Collate them in a space in my chapel, and I just leave them there, and then eventually they get, you know, I just I look and I go, oh, this is what the spell is. And I don't actually know what it is beforehand, or that I even need it. It just sort of manifests of its own accord into a spell work. Or I can go with a plan, like I was doing with the my coven and working with the box and sealing the box. That very specifically was we had a plan in mind, it wasn't intuitive. We were like, this needs to happen, so we're going to do X actions to do this function, and I was very planned. So I kind of think of intuitive and planned spell work versus formal versus informal, but I think that also could fall into um, similar categories of planned versus intuitive. Because you start getting into like ceremonial magic when you start going, well, it's planned spell, we gotta have a nine foot circle. No, actually this room is big enough. We could probably pull off like a nine foot diameter circle and could do some <laughs> OTG stuff. That might be interesting. Different day, we'll do that a different day maybe. Uh, but there is certainly ordered spell work and intuitive spell work. And I think, I mean, also that too it goes into some of that spontaneous aspect of it too. Because the spontane spontaneity might just be, oh, it's time to do a spell, and suddenly everybody's there, or you're all drumming, or you're doing something that everybody just happens to be on the same page, and the synchronicity aligns, and then just spontaneously, you're like, we're doing spell work now. And how much, where do we start drawing lines, distinctions of like what constitutes spell work? Is spell work just, I, you, you, just you start seeing where some of these behaviors are getting a little muddy. <laughs> Uh, and so I do think that that intention is going to be a really big part of that. But thank you for the static dance um, concept of thaumaturgy for a third theurgic reason. I think that does connect a lot of people. I've had debates recently where some people said, well, well, modern chaos people, you know, they, they have no connected thing. Anything that you are doing as a human is going to innately be connected. It's going to have some consistent thread behind it. Right? So it's going to be unconnected even just by you, by virtue of you existing and you doing the thing. The connectivity is in just you, right? So even a modern chaos which is going to end up having some sort of connectivity, maybe not to one specific pantheon. But my original thought of, during that debate was that it, it's connected by a thaumaturgic or theurgic purpose, right? They're doing something for one of those two reasons, even if it's not a codified practice or a cohesive thing and it's just spontaneous across the board. It's still connected by some sort of intent or purpose, just by virtue of the person wanting to do a thing. That, so all, it seems to me, at least at present, that it would be all witchcraft seems to have some sort of goal in mind, and there's some connective thread behind anybody's work, chaotic or ordered. I don't need that part now. I'm just making sure that I got through each one of these pieces. Go, expel ritual ceremonies, focus on its realm, works to bolster. Concepts of high versus low magic. 
we can get to distinctions of that, but I they to go back to Greece for this. Things that were above were generally celestial or divine in nature. High being theurgy, low being thaumaturgy, low being this realm, closer to. You start talking about, does anybody know anything about teleology? The study of religion? Not theology, teleology. T E L E O L O G Y. Teleological uh, came from ancient Greece. It's basically all objects have a purpose. Something they're trying to get back to. So the reason that we, mine is ancient Greece, their idea of why we have gravity is because everything that is on the earth is trying to get back to the center of the earth because the earth was the center of everything. The entire universe was the center of the earth in their opinion. And so when they had gravity is because everything was directed downwards to the center of gravity. I know teleology is a nightmare to try and explain philosophically, but basically that's the whole point. So when I say low magic, they literally mean low magic because it is literally going to the lowest point, which is why it's physical. Ergo, that's why thaumaturgy, not for any other really, you can come up with a lot of other reasons, but the same thing applies to theurgy. Everything that's ethereal in the air is higher than what is low. It doesn't want to. Its teleology, its reason for existence is not to get back to the center. It's to stay on the outside. So they didn't have a concept of infinite, didn't exist. They basically thought everything was just a ringed system, and the outside, outermost ring, was where the celestial beings all existed, and that's where they were. So that goes beyond Mount Olympus and all that stuff. That goes into like the Titans and that sort of thing. So the proto, the protonoi, the ones that made everything, according to the ancient Greeks. So they all hang out in the celestial realm, the divine outer ring, and that was the end of all things. Was that, and so the idea of the theurgic practice was to become more of that divine and borrow from that realm and bring it back down here, which is why we see things like miracle work and why they call it those kinds of things because of that reason, because they're talking about high versus low magic. That's why they're so deemed as high and low. You can make a bunch of different binary distinctions between this. You'll hear often black and white, high and low, good, bad, whatever that is, but they're referencing some of these similar concepts. And even going further, you know, utilizing this sort of Greek structure of divinity, uh, one thing that, does anybody know what drawing down is? Drawing down is in like invoking an entity into Yeah, your drawing down an entity or the moon. Into the circle. Yeah, right, right. I'm pretty sure, I'm like 98% confident in this, that it comes from the theurgic philosophy that was in ancient Greece, the stuff that we're talking about, because it talks about we're going to go and do this prayer, we're going to kneel down, we're going to talk about, we're going to access the divine, and we're going to partner with the divine and become more divine ourselves by that action of prayer. Ergo, they even reference it as drawing down the celestial. And I went, that's where it came from. That's the, this is the future practice. We're saying drawing down the moon, drawing down the deity, you know, being ridden by spirits, or even possession, I would even go so far as to make the potential statement fairly plausibly that it's connected to a theurgic working because of the definition of drawing down and accessing the celestial like that, accessing the high magic or the theurgic magic. So how does that connect to uh, bringing forth something from within yourself? It's like the opposite polarity of the drawing down is to bring up a genesis. Yeah. I don't know exactly. That's a good question. I think that the genesis, when you start getting into this is not my realm, I would have to ask G. Uh, Egregor and that sort of thing is going to be coming from sort of that lens, which is not my strong suit. Uh, but we do have some people that are much better at those kinds of physical manifestations from within, but I think that genesis of creating something from oneself. I don't know. I'm not exactly sure how to answer that question. Because it's really, if I generate something for myself, I don't think that I'm trying to become more egoless, or that that makes sense in what I'm saying. Uh, I think that you're trying to do something for the physical plane, that I'm going to bring something out, that I'm going to divide, you know, build this thing for a purpose, basically, for something in this realm. Generally, I don't, I've not seen or heard of that kind of a thing, like an or, for example, um, used for like, okay, you're going to sit out here and we're going to connect to the divine together. I don't usually see it for that purpose. Usually it seems to be, from what I have encountered, is that it tends to be something very physically based. 
So I still think that would be probably more of that thaumaturgy, just by virtue of the fact that we exist in the physical realm and not in the, not entirely in the metaphysical realm. <laughs> Yeah, I'm even thinking less so of like creating an egregore and more of like the theurgic personal enlightenment, like mm -hmm. uh, specifically referencing heart in zero point space, mm -hmm. uh, infinite connectivity mm -hmm. in potential, however you can access that. Yeah. Um, and then using that to inform the energetic structure of the body and mind and spirit connection such that one moves further into the theurgic realm, like uh, allowing the direct presencing and felt sense of the infinite to form a correspondence link to the theurgic impulse. Yeah, you got it. That's what the energy is. That's that's the whole game. Well, the majority of the game. That's the fundamental principles of that. That's why we have parent worship and those sorts of things for maintaining and building out that same connection to the divine or the celestial, whatever you want to call it, right? However you want to phrase that in your own practice. Um, that being said, then how do we do it? And why? And then you start seeing what the reason is behind the witchcraft, right? Because a lot of people haven't even considered. What am I doing my witchcraft for? What's the greater scope of me doing this? What's the reason behind it? Well, now, if you start thinking of in the urge of your father to her, so you go, oh, I'm doing this spell, or I'm doing this connection, or this meditation, or this dance, or this whatever it is, for these purposes. And it starts guiding your witchcraft into a more efficacious place, right? To have these kinds of definitions to work with. But certainly, you know, my form of prayer, for example, that I do every single day, morning and evening, like that is me maintaining exactly what you're talking about, my own connection to that. It didn't used to be that way, but I've seen results from that, that I can pinpoint and go, this thing happened since I've been doing X, and I keep seeing an increase of those things exponentially every single day, every single hour, and it's like, oh, I'm seeing a lot of different things now because I started doing this practice that was there was a phase change. The phase change is basically a new behavior that you've introduced, and then now other things are happening. They weren't happening before that phase change, but now they are happening. And so I am motivated. This is part of where we get into some of the religious context, right? Religion provides a uh, basically moods and motivation that are uniquely realistic to you, right? I am motivated by the fact that these things I am seeing consistently occur. And I'm motivated, I'm like, oh, I want to keep this connection open, I want to keep doing this because I'm gaining something from this. I'm, and I'm gaining something in the thaumaturgic sense from that theurgic link. And that's where we're getting back to that same kind of conversation before, that they're just different sides of that polarity. The more theurgic stuff that I do, the more that I connect and partner with the celestial. Essentially, my practice is astrology on steroids is the easiest way to phrase that. Um, but basically, a lot of the theurgic introduction I've had with working with Celestial, I've partnered with that Celestial form of magic, and it's influencing my abilities in thaumaturgic works in this realm. But to do so and continue that potency and efficacy, my intent is then, of course, to maintain that connection because I don't want to lose the, that work, right? I don't want to lose that, that impact. Um, Similarly, I did this when I worked with fairies. I did that for a couple of years, long story. But I asked them, I was like, okay, you can use, I said, I invite you to use my house as your uh, as an extension of your realm, by all means. I know when they can dismiss, some, uh, some of the parameters that I have. But I said, I know when they can dismiss you from this particular location or say, no, nope, you can't be here anymore, uh, and vice versa. But then the other thought was that when I didn't pay the fairy door, so I had a fairy door that I built and then I would give it like, you know, various trinkets and treats and that sort of thing, my magic worked fine, and it was great. But if I didn't pay the door, and I was doing spells, what would end up happening is it was nothing, or it would just be, like, just nonsense. And I, was, and I would look at it and go, why is this suddenly not working? And I went, did I pay the door? And I didn't pay the door, and I was like, oh, I forgot to pay the door. Again, ramifications of spell work, right? I made a deal with the fairy, which is a whole other long conversation of what even that is, but making that deal, I had to continue to pay the cost for the door, and when I didn't, suddenly everything that I did was just mess, and it was just nonsense, and I was like, I don't understand this. And it would be restored when I paid the door and wait, you know, 
the you know, next day it would be totally fine. It would work exactly as I knew before. Switching from that partnering, I've now partnered similarly with the celestial stuff that I work with, that force or metaphor, however you want to phrase that, and I'm seeing similar, similar effects. But the cost is, of course, there's always a cost to anything that you're doing. The cost for me is that maintain this thing. Maintain my first altar. First altar is the altar of the self, right? And so I have to maintain myself. I have to make sure that I'm okay, that I'm stable, that I'm active, devoted, and disciplined during prayer consistently for access to that. And there's a there's a reciprocal relation there between those things. Um, that was also a lot of information, so I'll give you guys a second one. Like, consult this. And it works, because reciprocal and ongoing equilibrium is exactly what I was just going about to talk about, too. Um, all of these things can be deconstructive or constructive, depending on where we want to go with this. In momentary stuff, you're crafting or building things for here. Uh, in theurgic, you're doing things that are more for psyche, the less ego and that kind of thing. And you can have internal and external thaumaturgy as well. You have a duty to your first altar, the altar of the self, and if you aren't maintaining that first altar, you can't really do or be efficacious in your craft, or really anything, right? So if I don't eat, don't sleep, I'm tired, and I'm burnt out, or I'm angry, or I'm not managing my emotions, or any of those self-care things, this form is no longer capable to create in a healthy way, right? You can probably create, but it's going to come out a little warped and twisted because you're not all the way there. And there's certainly days where I just won't cast. I won't like do stuff, I won't interact in you know, a you know, magical sense because of the reason that I'm not prepared in that way, that I'm too distracted or whatever's going on for me is just not going to be respectful enough for that, so I just abstain instead. The more that I connect, the more that I do these kinds of things, the easier it is for me to maintain myself, and that tends to help. We receive by the capacity we are ready to receive, right? So we won't receive as much as we are ready to, to receive at all. So anything that you're channeling or whatever is going to come to you in terms of what you're prepared to handle, however your vessel is prepared, however that first altar is prepared. And the questions I would have, um, so there's a seeming kind of paradox of theurgy, thaumaturgy, that link that we're talking about. How does this perspective shift your witchcraft between, with just what are some of your initial thoughts between thaumaturgy and theurgy and having this kind of broader definition of those things. It's obviously a very useful distinction. <laughs> well, I'm glad, or else I just, you know, I'll just pack myself up and I'll just go on. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, and I didn't have this distinction despite years of magical training, so that's, like, how did that get left out? Right. Right. Uh, Anyone else? I feel like it also kind of like, because right, I've never really kind of thought about that, but then it's like, now when I look back at like my practice of like, what am I doing this more, yeah. you know, theur theurgic versus thaumaturgic, you know, where it's like, when I am, you know, doing a bigger spell and, can't, you know, bringing down the deities or whatever, and it's like, oh, I'm doing a little bit more theurgic and I'm connecting more to the deities versus like, my daily stuff, or like if I'm reading tarot cards, or if I do like my simple prayers, or whatever that's more thaumaturgic, because it's just like, and just yeah, just make that distinction of what in my own practice is a little bit more this versus a little bit more that. Exactly. Any other thoughts? Cool. Well, there is plenty of information on this. You can watch our sermons and that sort of stuff on our YouTube, like I've said, and we have more information. You can sort of just stop and start and write down notes and I have graphs and that sort of thing. Not one. They are items that I have borrowed or visual aids that I've borrowed from other sources that I highlighted in those videos to give them their due credit because a lot of this is us. We're all learning together, right? I didn't just manifest this miraculous thing. like I suddenly have all this information like I learned from a lot of different places and I started I really do my best and I encourage everybody to try to poke holes in your own theories especially if you start saying hey I have this thing and it means X does it really mean X uh, Simone de Beauvoir is a philosopher from France no shock 
her stages of existence, for example, come from this childlike infancy, where you start getting new concepts, and then you move into a truth of some iteration. And then you move on beyond that into more of the ethically minded or the wider stuff. The problem is, and is that the that middle part is where a lot of people get stuck. They go, this is my truth. Forget everything else that anybody has ever, ever said in the history of forever. And they just get stuck and say, my truth is my truth, and you cannot do this. And that to me is a really toxic place to be. So if you find a truth, or you think it's a truth, this is why I don't really run with ultimatums, like uh, universal maxims, rules that exist for everybody, because I think they're fair, I think that's really narcissistic that you even could have the power to be able to define something completely definitively as a universal truth is really difficult for me to accept uh, in general. But keeping these days in mind, if you come up with a truth or it's something that you come across, you're like, that's what that is. Find ways to try and disprove your own thing. That that honing is helpful, that refining is part of your part of witchcraft. You know, we made a distinction of what defines witch, right? And now I take the first time that we did that, we only had one component that defined what which is, and I realized later on, that's too broad. And so we had to adapt. And so I added a couple more, talked to the clergy, and we said, this is what we think now. So we've added two new distinctions, and it seems to be working. But again, everything is in a, this constant flux. I'm not going to ever say that I'm the one truth. We are one way, not the way. And even if you have your own way, and you're a solitary practitioner, you will have one way, and then it's going to evolve. What my practice looks like now, I was not doing celestial witchcraft when I was nine. That didn't exist. I was doing pendulum stuff and occult technology things and doing divination stuff that had no basis whatsoever. But now, all this time later, it's totally different. So things will evolve, and I'll let them evolve. And if you get trapped in that stage of just my truth is my truth and everybody else is wrong, and you're trying to use your standards on everybody else, you're just going to get frustrated and make people really grumpy with you instead of being receptive. So the church is, it has this in mind as well, since I'm part of its operations, that we want to ensure that we have this kind of fluidity, this accepting of this collaborative ideation of we're not always right. And sometimes we're going to have to adapt to things that we say may be incorrect. And we're going to do our best and do our due diligence. But similarly with your own witchcraft, when you're doing thaumaturgy, you're doing theurgy, whatever it is, do your due diligence. If not just for yourself, at least for that. If you're just errantly doing spells, you're like, I don't know, I'm just going to do a spell. I'm going to light a candle and I'm going to go out the moon. It's like, Kendall, why are you doing that? What does it matter? Why do you do any of these things? What are any of these behaviors, these rituals that you're doing? What's the purpose? What's the point? And if you don't know why you're doing it, then stop doing it. I mean, you can sort of hand fist your way into this thing and just be like, I'm just going to do all the rituals I can possibly find and maybe eventually I'll run into something, but that's kind of like a brute force option, and there's plenty of people that have talked a lot about various topics that you could probably look and not just reinvent the whole wheel again, because we've been talking about this for all of human history, so maybe look at some other sources and include those, and get curious about whatever it is you're doing and how your practice works. Um, am I out in time? Probably I might be over. I have really gotten my opinions down to science. Um, any questions about that? What kind of, uh, we'll stop there and then I'll ask my next question. Uh, I'm curious about your board there, like the, the symbols and why you chose those symbols and how you incorporated it, how you charged it, how you access it, uh, anything about that that you want to share? Of? Really love to hear. Sure. So very broadly, I need to redo this thing since it's been on my in the cult library for a while. So what you'll see, does anybody know what this is? The Saturn for Jupiter or Saturn? Jupiter. Okay. Yep. So Jupiter. What does Jupiter represent? Expansion, wealth. Um, yep. Knowledge, prosperity. plastic, all of those kinds of things. So this to this was the invocation of using Jupiter specifically for that knowledge and expansion of knowledge and retention of that. It is within, so that's my, so celestial witchcraft, right? Using astrological bodies and that sort of thing to affect a chain theurgically and thaumaturgically. A really complicated definition of that. And it's within this matrix. And this matrix is basically a seven-pointed heptagram, which I have a, an affinity for. 
And that's kind of the representation of that chaos of knowledge and development of the I'm not really sure, right? It's not all the way formed. And it's surrounded by an octagon, the eight points, which we're really just enforcing a structure on top of that disorder that knowledge is. So it's it's con it's connecting all of those pieces together to form a lasting bond, basically, between those. So that's the intention of this specific thing. Um, no one taught me how to do this. I just used principles of alchemy that I had read and learned about. Black Toad is another book that's really great for alchemists if you really want to get into that. Um, and I already had previous knowledge about astrological symbols and their meaning, all of that stuff. And so I connected all of those together to make this particular working. In terms of charging, I think that initially it was using uh, Celestial Light uh, Lunar specifically, because I'm not very solar oriented. Super shocking, I'm sure, for even people who are brand new to me are like, what, you don't like the sun? That's so surprising. It's like, I'm not a big fan. Uh, I recognize and I respect that it has a purpose and a place, because otherwise we don't be dead. <laughs> um, so I charge in lunar uh, light now, and primarily. Occasionally, I will recharge so the three Cs, uh, cleanse, consecrate, charge. I will do that as is necessary, or if the if I feel like the efficaciousness is not working, or I'm not seeing the same kind of retention occurring, or I'm feeling like there's a discord, and it usually comes in the form of kind of an inner quiet that's not supposed to be there, right? And so when I'm using tools and that implements, there's a certain conversation, at least I guess I would call that energetically or magically, between me and the object that I'm using. And I can feel that, and when there's a, there's, a, there's a that underlying kind of hum almost between those two things, and when that hum gets quieter or is gone entirely, it's time to throw it back out on the moon or something or do some form of whatever, right? I have to do less of that charging now, I find, because I have the occult library, which is just a nine by nine room in my house, but basically the, it is full of magical objects all the time and magical people all the time in my house, so the charging has not been as uh, needed as much or as frequently because there's so much around it all the time. My problem that I'm running into now is that uh, detritus. So things overlapping that I don't want to be overlapping. So I have the intention of this board. I don't need the intentions of another, like, I don't need a, the, the intentions of a hex or something jumping into the mix of this thing, right? And this kind of interference going on. And that's what I'm running into. So that's a whole other conversation. But that's what I've been running into. And the same thing goes. So with this uh, rings as well, I have an obsidian crystal that follows me around. Actually, it's in there. Now that I just thought about that. Let's see if I can pull this thing all the way out. Buried it really deep in here because they're fragile. It's an obsidian crystal sphere, right? This has a stand, sits in the occult library, and my rings every night take them off, and I put them next to this thing. This thing gets consistently charged over and over and over. I use it all the time. It hangs out in the chapel a lot. It goes around with me to a lot of places, and so there's a lot of charge that is just sort of around, and so I charge my rings every single night. It's just drawing from this, uh, in my opinion. I would love to see if I can create the same or replicate the same results with other people's tools. I'm not sure if that would work or be applicable, but I suspect that it might be. And if it is, then that raises a whole bunch of other interesting questions that I don't exactly have answers for. Does so that sort of give you a breakdown of those kinds of things? Yeah, the, the last question I would have then on that is like, why the silver? Is the silver significant or just pretty or? <laughs> Yes, all of those things. Um, also looks good on the black contrast. Is right. The lunar connection. I can see lots of reasons, but yeah, I'm wondering what yours were. Uh, specifically, it's silver is what's connected to my mind in the celestial. So, and pretty much anything that comes from silver moonlight, I suspect. You know, whether that's my own ideation or if that's programming or if it's both, it's probably somewhere between there. But I have a propensity for silver, like pure silver. So all of my all the metal you see is, well, not this, but my jewelry is all pure silver because of my preference. It's easier to work with instead of trying to like work through a striated medium. So if you have a mixture of metals, you're working through, you're bringing in other pieces, whereas pure gold, pure any of those things are going to be more consistent with working because it's an easier pipeline to work with. 
I mean, you can use a charcoal sieve that you're going to get a whole bunch of other junk in your water. Or you can get a really nice one that has like filters and osmosis and all those sorts of things, and it's way better, but they're doing the same effective thing. One's just less effective than the other. Uh, so yeah, I have, a, I have an affinity for silver in general. I tend to stray away from gold. Uh, it's probably, I would honestly, I tend to connect gold with solar and silver with lunar more often than not. Uh, you'll also see that I have obsidian and onyx tourmaline are three stones that I tend to work with pretty frequently. Uh, they're it's like my home stone I'm used to, uh, and I wear these all the time. So there's a, a connection there as well for the particular stones that I'm wearing. I don't really deviate from those specific stones very much. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other jewelry that you guys might be wearing that you use? Any reasons behind it? Um, this one's like lapis lazuli or, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, I just, I find connected to it, I'm not really sure why, but I definitely have a lot of stones with this now. Yeah. Um, like I have like a little skull and a little elephant and this ring, I think I have something else too. And so it's like this one and like citrine are like my two oh. that I huh. really... I'm drawn to. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah, or drawn to more. I actually usually have a citrine like stone on me, but I don't. I brought it in for bed today, so uh -huh. I'm like, oh shoot, I left that in my other bed. Um, but yeah, those are the two that I just feel more drawn to. And I, I this one's more recent. I want to say it's been like the last like year and a half, two years. I've been more drawn to lapis, but um, citrine I've been drawn to for a really long time. Right. Yeah, so I'm not really sure why. Look into it. See what you find. Yeah. I don't know what the answer is. Man. <laughs> okay. I can sit with you and figure it out probably. We can probably work through some, some various tones and things and figure it out. Yeah. Um, I talked about this in Eyes and Witch, um, one of our sermons that we talked about this of being observant. You may not know why you're doing a thing. You have a weird affinity suddenly for lapis and and citrine. Mm -hmm. Run with it, right? There's a reason that you're doing that. There's some purpose behind that. There's some something that has some tie in. Any others? For me right now, it's been um, angel light, so I just have a little bracelet. Oh, neat. And I've had other like uh, light blue, like celestite, and uh, I think opal. There's like a light blue opal. Mm -hmm. um, and then also different kinds of jasper. Oh, interesting. I don't know many people that work with jasper, so that's cool. Yeah. Well, thank you. So, Bob Turgy, working with things in the physical plane for your own self-development. And I'll give you the definition of which is what we're currently using. And it's somebody who, um, it's a very long conversation, but basically they manifest with intent, internally and externally. They channel into through themselves that are conduit. And the other thing that they do is that they very specifically tend to increase their potency and efficacy. Those three things seem to be the most likely definitions of what which is and i and so far that definition has been working pretty well right because somebody who doesn't do you know some of them get pretty close some even sects of christianity fall into this but there's still that are you channeling for the reason to increase your potency and accuracy for yourself or are you just channeling through you from a deity right that's not about your own potency and efficacy that's just something working through you and you are channeling, but you're not necessarily in manifesting. So using these kinds of depth, these that basic inventory seems to be working pretty well, and it seems pretty consistent across most witches that most of them are interested in developing themselves versus them, you know, paying fealty to some deity only and not helping themselves. There's a that seems to be a common thread. With that said, thaumaturgy, theurgy, develop those things to enhance the three general practices of witches that they do, their general functionality that they work with. There's a lot of ways to do all three of those things. So, any other questions for me before we close up for the evening and leave this forsaken building? <laughs> so, okay then. Well, I appreciate you all being here. Uh, we do have the dark moon that is coming up. On um, the 25th of October, it's going to be at my house. There's depth, there's directions and stuff on our website. You can do that. So if you want to join us and you happen to be in the Colorado Springs area, 
You can also go to the Denver Dark Moon as well that's occurring. So there's two cities that are doing different things that are connected to the Church of Witchcraft. You can find it on our website, you can find it on our Facebook, you can find it on our Discord. And also segue, please hang out on our Discord. There's a lot of people that are sort of starting to flock and congregate there. And we're talking about some of these things and talking about our practices and how we work together and sharing information in a central location that's not just one particular modality. And we always encourage people's interactions. So thank you all for being here and listening. And we will see you probably uh, at another one of these as well. Online. Online. Next one. Yes, I did mention that. So anybody who isn't uh, in person, uh, November, we're going, we'll be doing our sermon online, and there'll be a little bit more interaction, uh, just like everything will have recorded, and we'll be uploaded to our YouTube as well for your viewing pleasure. <laughs> All right, thanks again for watching, and we will talk to you in the not-too-distant future. Feel free to comment down below, subscribe, do all those things, assuming that YouTube is still a thing, and that's where this is. <laughs> Thank you. You are welcome.